So um, let me pray for you guys real quick, and then we will go. Lord, thank you so much for Scott, for Suzanne, for just this awesome couple, who they are as individuals, who they are as a couple in our church. Uh, Lord, the way you've placed your hand on them, and Lord, uh, just the way I've seen them grow and change, um, and Lord, just for the impact they've had on our church and the example they are. Um, but Lord, also just the, the, the way that you're using them and will continue to use them, Lord, I'm just thankful for that. Lord, I pray that you would just bless this time. Lord, I pray as we take some time and hear their story, um, how you collided with them and changed things, Lord, I just pray that um, you would touch their hearts, uh, give them clarity, let them communicate that well, but also, God, that even now, long before, that uh, you would prepare hearts, Lord, that maybe their story, they people could identify with it, Lord, that you would just touch their hearts and prepare them and use these words. Let their testimony change lives. So God, I just thank you. Thank you for Scott. Thank you for Suzanne. Just bless this time. Amen. All right, so I got Scott and Suzanne Boatner here. And uh, so like I said, we'll kind of go through this either way. Um, and then we'll kind of weave it all together in some way, shape, or form as I um, go numb and blind looking at a computer for hours on <laughs> Yeah. Thanks for fitness in this time because I know... Oh, no, no, no. This is, I'm just, the editing takes a long time, yeah. right? Um, but, um, okay. So let's, like, we start here and whoever can start, it doesn't really matter. So how would you describe uh, kind of your life growing up, your childhood, whatever the case may be? I guess growing up, um, my parents weren't very demonstrative as far as showing love or saying it um the things that i remember from my childhood are probably not the good things i don't remember a lot of friends or uh, just the things i see in pictures of oh we celebrated a birthday or whatever like that but um the things that i do remember is that yeah i, I didn't feel like i was good enough my father was French and he lived here and worked here, but he, he always thought everything in France was the best. And so if my cousin would visit, why aren't you more like her? Or just like I wasn't good enough. So, and then the church that we went to was it was like a a lot of Germans were in it so my father did not like it because he was in World War II and their country was occupied by Germans and sometimes they would have services in German and they were in the belief that only 144,000 would go in the rapture and I would think to myself, from the beginning of time, there's no way that I'm going to be this perfect person that's going to get to go. So that was another thing that bothered me about the church. I mean, and we never had Bible studies or anything like that. It was just what you heard on Sunday, Sunday night, and then Wednesday. It was... Just what you heard, what they said, not really what was, I mean, it might have been in the Bible, I don't know, but I don't remember the sermons now. Um, when I was 12, the other thing that was something that happened in my life, uh, a family member molested me, and I won't say who it was, but... I found out later in life, my sister was also molested by this person. And I'd never said anything to this person, but I have forgiven them. But I guess I don't want to confront them about it. So that was the other thing. And then, so when I became a teenager, I would start cutting school. Um, 
we'd go to New Jersey, my sister and I, and we'd visit the kind of lower drinking age, 18, and we'd go in there and start, you know, we'd drink. And so I guess when I was 17, I became very promiscuous. So if it wasn't like get to know the person, it was if they wanted sex, I was available. Thought maybe they I would they would love me if but um I guess I'm going on too far, but <laughs> I know it's fine. I mean like I said, you can keep going as long as you want. <laughs> but anyway, I lived with my mother my mother and father got divorced when I was in the ninth grade. So I was with my mother, and then when she found out I was cutting school, she sent me off to my dad's. And then my stepmom got upset with me one day, so she wanted to send me back, I don't know which, and then I went to live with this guy I was going out with, and that's when I became pregnant. And the first thing he said was, I'll pay for the abortion. And this was back when abortions were not available in Pennsylvania. You had to drive up to New York. And the whole time I was waiting, it was like I didn't want to do it. I thought, well, Planned Parenthood, they'll talk to you. Well, none of that happened. And I'm not blaming anybody else because I did. And I know now that I have a daughter in heaven that I will meet one day. But it's a regret I haven't. And I know God has forgiven me. Um, the name of the place that I went to to be restored from this was called, I can't think of it now, but it was just a weekend. And it was amazing when I went there. But I went there on a Friday night and left on a Sunday afternoon. How much they were able to restore my heart. Because when I was coming to church here, I still felt that shame, that guilt. I'm not good enough. But when I went there, I came back and I, I just said, I know that every one of those sins that I've committed have been paid and I am totally restored by Jesus. That it doesn't matter what you've done, that God loves you. And I probably skipped around all over the place. <laughs> no, you're completely okay. <laughs> You're completely okay. pretty proud of it. I, I skipped know over the whole part of our marriage and being yeah. messed hey, up. Hey, that's okay. That, that's the beauty of editing, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, if they watch the uncut version, they'll be like, man, she was all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, no, you you're doing no. great. You're doing great. For real. For ser seriously. You're doing you're doing good. Yeah. Yeah. Good. yeah. Yeah. So we'll and, and we'll come back to some of that. So <laughs> No, you're doing you're doing well. All right, Scott, how about you, man? Well, for me, I was uh, almost the total opposite of her. I was raised in southern Mississippi in a small town, had a great mother and a great father. I mean, my dad, uh, I still consider the superman of my life. He was a great guy. I was completely loved at all times, raised in the church, uh, in a southern Baptist church down there from the time I can remember walking. I remember walking into church Sundays, Sunday nights, Wednesdays. I remember always getting picked as being a, a wise man or a, or a shepherd or something at Christmas time to be in the play. Uh, before puberty, I could sing, so I was in the choir and pretty much did it all. My mother taught Sunday school, and I had that strong family, had a big family. And I, I, was, uh, I got baptized in 1971. I was 14 years old, and I remember getting baptized. But I don't really remember anything else about church after that much. Because right after I got baptized, I came to discover things like girls. And at 15, you could drive. And so I wanted a car. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I wanted a car mainly so I could go somewhere with girls. 
Edit that part out. No, that's, yeah, that's I fine. went Trinity. I might have COVID again. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. But I discovered some other things, too. Uh, I discovered weed, and I discovered drinking, and so I kind of drifted away. <clears throat> I spent a lot of my life drifting away farther and farther. Um, I don't blame the church for the fact that nobody really came beside me to show me how to be a Christian man, uh, except for my father, and so I always strove just to be like he was just to be that kind of a man. But like I said, the other things, on <clears throat> a 15, 16 year old guy, those other things start pulling pretty hard. Uh, so for me, my, my young life was, a lot of it was idyllic very early on. It was really, really good. My, my parents stayed together, never got divorced. Um, everything was going as good as it could go. I was raised to be a guy that always took care of whatever you did. You know, you always did the right thing. If it broke, you fixed it. We lived on a farm, rose, raised horses and cattle. Uh, always fixed everything. I always did that. And things were, things were fine for me until I got up here, moved to Tennessee in the early 70s, and got the, the, standout achievement of being the first guy in my senior class to have a pregnant girlfriend. Um, so our marriage got moved up real quick. We were actually married a block from here, the church behind us. Uh, and uh, that marriage didn't last very long either, but even at that time, I knew what I had to do. You know, she was pregnant, I had to marry her, I had to do something, and I immediately, right after high school, I got married and went in the service because that gave me uh, job training gave me a job, gave me medical and all that stuff. And so I, I just did that. The marriage kind of fell apart. And for most of the rest of the time after that, once I got divorced, I went back and tried to recapture those years that I had lost during then by spending my time playing music and partying and just having a big time. Um, I was always aware of God. I remember during that period, I remember going to bed at night a lot of times and saying prayers at night. And I remember thinking most of the time that I was saying those prayers was like, you probably don't really want to talk to me right now <laughs> after the way I have acted. Because I, even in the back of my mind growing up that way, I knew that what I was doing was wrong. But I was still doing it, uh, continuing to do it. Uh, and everything, everything was just, to me, was just uh, getting along, just doing it, just getting along. And then I met her and everything changed completely because she was the most wonderful thing I had ever met. I had just quit dating women completely because I thought they were all psychos. And <laughs> at a certain point, you learn that maybe it's not them that are psychos. Um, yeah, I don't know how far you want to go. No, that's, yeah, that's fine. Okay. So at this point, I mean, you can, either, you can keep going or we can kind of... So at this point, you guys... Like, how old were you guys when you guys met? And what, it was 82? 83. So, how old Because we got married in 84. Yeah, I know. I know when we got married, but how old were, how old were you? In 84? Yeah. <laughs> she's, she's, well, she's an abacus, don't we? Yeah. 32. <laughs> okay, and I'm five years younger, so. So, so at this point, so. then, you guys have been, you know, gone through kind of a aloof childhood with kind of this ominous, I'm uh, never good enough to where, you know, an idyllic childhood, yeah. but yet kind of chasing after the wrong things. Oh, yeah. But yet you both found yourself in a similar situation, be it, you know, pregnant, got pregnant, um, you know, military, and then you kind of, by the sounds of it, probably after the abortion, found yourself kind of wondering and where all this stuff kind of was. You know, I guess the question is, you know, um, so unless there's something you want to kind of mention before, between, you know, 20 and 30, let's say, go for it. But other than that, if not, you know, tell me about like what then happened as you guys met and got married, kind of what did that look like and how, how did life shift from there? Well, you continued to play music and party on the weekend. <laughs> we were married, but you know, that was a, the lifestyle. I was... <laughs> It was hard for me because I was, we'd go to a friend's and they'd be playing music and I'd be sitting on the couch and I'd fall asleep. <laughs> well, you know, 11 o'clock and I'd be going, 
<laughs> and it'd be so loud, <laughs> I'd be asleep. <laughs> but that's awesome. We didn't go to church anywhere. We we'd say, "This is so stupid." We'd say, "We believe in God, but we don't have to go to church," is what we said, which is a stupid thing to say. <laughs> Because as the years went on, we had David um, in 87, so we've been married three years. And, you know, that puts demands on your marriage and such. And, um, and then maybe several, I don't know how many years later, there was a lot of deaths in our family. You know, um, his mother and father both died within 18 months. His brother died. Um, I had an aunt and an uncle and a nephew, and uh, my, then my father died. So there was a lot of mourning within maybe five years. I mean, it was a lot. I'd lost my mother when I was 27. And that was one, I was going to church at that time before I met Scott, and I was listening to Kenneth Copeland and believing that she was going to be healed, and then when she wasn't, I was mad at God. And some of it was, well, he doesn't love me, so that's why he didn't do it. <laughs> he doesn't love me enough. So there was my problem again with not being loved. So, but as years went on, we started, I don't know, I think the deaths kind of got him into an angry mode. He did not know I had had an abortion. So he'd see things on TV about women and abortion and he'd call them names and I would just retreat. And, not say anything and when he'd get angry I'd shut up and wouldn't say anything and then I started getting very depressed and I'd think of ways to kill myself and I don't know they were stupid things like driving my car as fast as I could into the back of a semi truck or so that it would look like an accident and I hadn't really done it <laughs> well. um, Huh? You ran your car into the back of a semi truck, <laughs> <laughs> but it was stationary. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, I don't know. And then I type into a Google, you know, how many pain pills or whatever do I have to take to kill myself or muscle relaxers? And one time I took about five pills, and you know, and I stopped because I started thinking about David and everything. So I just felt sick the next day. Um, it was awful. I was so depressed. And I got us in financial trouble because I just didn't care about paying the bills. I just didn't care about anything. I just did not care. Uh, sometimes I wished he'd die. That's awful. But I did. I just wish everything would go away, you know just so I could get out of the situation. Um, we went to a birthday party for his, um, Jackson. For, for Jackson, our grandson. And we were sitting there on the picnic tables, I think it was, and he said, well, I'll just pack up all my stuff and move out, which is what I wanted him to do. But when he said it, I don't know, I just, I said, no, no. It was like I really didn't want that. And then when I would go visit my sister in Morristown, I, I started going to church with her at her church. And I think it was after my dad died, I rededicated my, if you want to call it that, I said, I just can't do this anymore. I said, I need, you know, I just need Jesus in my life. I need God in my life. And and that's what I finally said to Scott. I said, we need God in our lives or this is not going to work. And so that's when we started 
looking at different churches and it turned out that canvas was the one that we liked of course i always remember scott's statement you're not going to see me here the music was too loud you're not going to see me here on my uh, sunday night and wednesday night but then you know something would come up that said we're going to have a something on wednesday we used to have it was a small group then and somebody have a teaching on wednesday night and i said i think i'm going to go to that and then he'd come you know <laughs> and so we're pretty much here most of the time and i remember my brother asking me because he knew we were having troubles because i think he was there at my sister's house when we had an argument i don't know what you call it <laughs> everybody knew it was going on that we were having troubles and he says well did you go to counseling? And I said, no, we just went to church and God healed our marriage. I mean, we put God first and it healed our marriage. I think we need to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so at this point, Scott, you guys are in a place where you're married. You've had, you know, you've had your son. You've got, you know, so it's you two and David and everything, you know, godless and for the most part and dysfunctional in a lot of ways kind of from your perspective i mean kind of hop in that vein and i remember walking out of the house one time and you said i don't know what she i, I just left because it was terrible and you said you were going to kill yourself or something uh, yeah I don't probably know. Crazy. Uh, when i yeah and suzanne touched on that when she talked about burying people like i said i had always regardless of whether things were good or bad i'd always <clears> been able to fix them if the car broke, I could fix it. If the house broke, I could fix it. You know, I thought well, when people started dying, I couldn't fix that. I couldn't do anything about it. And what was the worst part about all that was that I became very selfish in that. Uh, I wasn't, during all that time that I was struggling with losing people because losing my mother and father was a tough, tough thing for me. I didn't realize she was struggling because I, I, I was looking at me all the time. I wasn't paying attention to the fact that, that the stuff that I was struggling with and not doing a good job of was hurting her just as, as bad. And she needed me to be the husband. And I wasn't being one. I wasn't being a good father. I wasn't being a good husband. I was being a really bad husband. Uh, I didn't really seem to care one way or another. And kind of like what Suzanne said, it's a lot of points. I, I never thought about suicide or anything like that. I just wanted out. I just wanted to, you know, just to open the door and just go somewhere. And I actually did want to leave. Uh, going on what she said there when she said we need to put God in her life, I remember responding back to her, you think God can fix this? <laughs> I don't think God's big enough to fix this. <laughs> you know, because he lets me say stupid stuff a lot. <laughs> uh, and I've said it a lot. Um, and I, I didn't realize at the time that the rest of the family was so aware of what was going on. And to their credit, I, I want to shout out to her sister and, and uh, her husband that they were lifting me up in prayer when I didn't think I deserved any prayer. I thought somebody ought to take me out behind a barn and whip on me because that's what I deserved. Um, they were praying for us that whole time. And so when, uh, when we did decide to go look at churches, we did go to several churches for the most part, I walked in and I got just what I was expecting to get. I didn't want to be in there. <clears throat> I didn't think they wanted me to be in there. And I knew it, well, that wasn't going to fix what our problem was. Once again, Canvas was a different story. When I walked in this place, uh, same as her, it was we were welcomed here. It was a different type of people that were here. And we felt a little bit better. And the more we stayed, uh, the heavier it got. All my life that I had lived as what I thought a Christian was, I had never heard God speak to me, say things to me. Uh, I'm pretty sure I heard him laughing at me a lot, you know, <laughs> called me funny names. But here I heard it because I remember early on while we were here when I was still struggling and still showing up hungover and, you know, not wanting to be here so much except that, you know, uh, we were and it was okay. Uh, I remember God saying, you need to get comfortable here. You're going to be here a while. And that was pretty powerful for me to hear that because I've never heard God say something like that to me. 
What surprised me the most about it, and we have discussed this a lot, when my mother was on her deathbed, uh, I was, uh, I had all of the legal authority on there. My mother told me what she wanted. She wanted me to cut everything off and let her go. My mother had been in a pretty much a drug-induced coma for a couple of days after her stroke, and I, it came to that point where the doctor said, you got to make that decision. You know, you have to say cut off life support. And, uh, and I knew it was the right thing to do. She did. The rest of my family did. I had no, nobody was against me on that. They all said, you need to do it. But I didn't know how to do it. Uh, I, that was a tough, tough thing for me to do. And I remember going into a, a recliner at ICU in a dark place and sitting there and closing my eyes. And I remember saying, God, you probably don't remember me because <laughs> we haven't talked a lot. I said, but this is a tough, tough decision. I said, I know what's right. I know what I have to do. And I know what mom thinks but I'm the one that has to go do it. And I remember sitting in there for two hours solid when at the end of the two hours, my sister came running and grabbed me and said, you gotta come in here and see. And the nurses were holding the doors open. And I went in there, my mother was awake, sitting up. She couldn't talk because she still had stuff down her throat. They had ripped the whiteboard off the wall and she was sitting in there writing notes to everybody in the family. And when I came in and she pulled me over, she said, uh, she wrote down on this, she said, you know what you have to do and it's okay, I'm ready to go. I've talked to God, I'm ready to go. Now that I'm talked to God thing was pretty heavy for me. But the next thing she wrote was, God has a plan for this family. And that cut me off the knees because I didn't know how to do that because I knew what that meant was I couldn't fix things like that. God had something he wanted me to do. And I, I that scared me, it scared me hugely. I didn't know. And so when I got here, and those things started coming together. I was thinking, maybe that's what this is. And, and over the weeks that we started coming here, things started working with our relationship. Um, we went to several classes. I know that Pastor Angel at that time was doing a, a marriage class that was incredibly helpful for us. We were able to, to start come to terms with each other and with ourselves. And the first thing that we had to learn to do was to put ourselves second and put God first. And it worked. Once we started doing that, we had a lot of rough, rough times. Uh, Suzanne had rough things, and I had rough things, and we started working those out together, but we didn't do it ourselves. We did it with God. And it, it, was, a, it was a struggle. So well worth it. I, I can never say anything but that. Uh, it, was just, it was just amazing, but I, I remember the day in here on a Sunday, sitting in that sanctuary during worship, when I just got extremely emotional during worship, and I sat down in my chair, because I'm not a kneeling guy, my knees are shot, I'm an old guy. I sat down in my chair, and everything that I had done wrong to her, and everything that I'd done wrong to the kids, and all the things that I knew as being a Christian growing up were sins, I started reciting all those things over and over again, and I had the warmest feeling that somebody was just sitting next to me with his arm around me. And I'm going, you know, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. And all I kept hearing was, yeah, I know. Let's get up and go. Let's go. Let's just go on past this. And that, that to me was probably the hugest thing that had ever happened to me in my life. Ever. And, uh, and now, here we are. So, I might get emotional, don't get <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying not to. I don't know. Ask another question. Okay. <laughs> so you guys find yourself here. You know, you're in, you're in a position where at this point, you know, you're in church. You you know, you'd rededicated your heart to the Lord a little bit before this, I guess. And then yeah. you know, you do this. You know, and you're in church. You're you're striving to do this. So you're in a safe place to heal, right? Um, God is beginning to work and move, you know, so I guess, you know, what were some of the steps? And I think you've already said this a little bit, but that you would say got you from there to here. Like, so let's say the last just several years, like what are some things that stick out? Like maybe decisions you guys made or things you did together, conversations or as far as be it for you as an individual or as you as a couple, like what are some things that kind of stick out that you'd say this was instrumental in the transformation that was happening in in my life and our marriage per se 
Well, first of all, reading the Bible. Yeah. I had never read the Bible <clears throat> through. I had read verses. That's all I had ever done. And that was wonderful. And then doing devotions together. Yeah. We had never done that, of course, and praying together. I mean, that's wonderful to do that together. Um, the one thing that I did personally was remember why I had, I had married Scott. What were the feelings that I had? What did I love about him? And those were the things that I focused on when I got here. Um, and not, when you get in a bad place, you're just looking at what's the bad habits or what you don't like about a person instead of what you love about the person. Because at that point, I did not love him or I didn't feel like I loved him or whatever, but we were committed to staying married and and we definitely do love each other now. <laughs> um, I guess that's it, is doing all the things that God wants you to, you know, in order to stay connected to Him and staying connected to each other through God. I think that's so important. I mean, <laughs> if we'd only done it so many years ago, it would have been <laughs> great. But. Sure. Yeah. I, and I agree with her. It was us coming together with God and us because I, I remember her going off to work one day and I'm sitting there just immersed in my Bible. And I'd had Bibles all my life. I'd never been immersed in one before. And we started doing our devotions together. We did start praying together, but we started communicating. We were communicating at a higher level because uh, me and We Steve, could not communicate. No, before. we couldn't before, but uh, yeah, I became way, way less selfish, and more focused on her. Um, you know, we, we were honest about getting things out, honest about saying, you know, th this upsets me. This makes me be mad. This is not right. This we need to fix. And we worked on it. We worked on it together as a couple, which is what we should have been doing before. And I finally right. told Scott about the abortion I had had, yeah. which is something you shouldn't have between a husband and wife, that big of a thing. <laughs> How did that go? Like... How did how did that go down? Like, if you don't mind telling me that story, like, and I'm sure there's some apprehension there, fear, like, you know, explain that whole moment. Like, I think it was a night here at Canvas, and I don't remember what it was. If it was a worship service or it was a oh, it was during the week. It was during the week, yeah. and I remember a bunch. I, I don't know if it was prayer people or. But I know Angela was standing up there, and I went up there, and I still didn't have the nerve to tell anybody. But I said to her, there's something in my past that I've never told Scott. And he asked me afterwards, what did you go up there for? So I told him. And he said... I think he said, um, I love you even more yeah. for telling me. That was a pivotal point in the marriage. Mm -hmm. yeah. It brought a lot of things to a head because I had been that guy that said and looked at the TV and said, well, all abortion is murder and, you know, I hate that. And I didn't know that she had had one. So during a lot of our relationship, I was just stabbing a knife into her heart over and over and over again. And at that moment when she told me that, I had nothing but forgiveness and love for her. Nothing but. If that had happened 10 years before, it would have been the end of our relationship. And we just went several ways. Um, that was a, a very pivotal moment because it was very, very tough for her to do it. It was really hard. And, uh, and I did love her more. So it was pretty big. I think the reason I had clammed up about it was because I'd never told anybody but my sister. And, well, maybe not. There was a woman at a church I had gone to, um, I guess after I'd had it. And she said, be careful who you tell. 
you might turn somebody away from becoming a Christian. And so I never told anybody else. And I think that brought more shame. If anybody would know that I did this, they wouldn't love me. Deeper still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Deeper. And, and I, I just want to throw something in there, too, because that weekend she went to that getaway was pivotal. It was one of the heaviest things I've ever seen happen in my life because she came back way different than she left. Yeah, I remember when you went the week, because, of course, I didn't know any of this, right? But I remember you came back and had written that letter yeah. and told me and you know it was so was hard <laughs> uh, and I know it was because you were so nervous and you're sitting there holding you're shaking as you had you know and I can remember that moment though because I could see the fear right and I knew that was a big step and I knew that was hard but at the same time you could tell there was such a peace in being able to get that off of you right I mean it was like this whole I'm apprehensive I'm nervous but I, I'm at a place now where I know I have to do this and that's such a liberating moment, right? Um, but it, it was one of those things where like, you know, it was, it was funny because I, I, I had a thing like Scott, like, you know, obviously I disagree with abortion a hundred percent, right? We all know well, this, I but <laughs> yeah, I know you do, but I'm saying, but there's still this thing in you that it's not, would you do? It's like, Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Right. Like it's this thing of, I'm sorry. You've had to carry that weight. Right. You know, because that is a weight and yeah. We've all done things that are wrong, but that's one of those ones that like latches onto you, right? That you just carry it for so yeah. long. I think I was 19 and then I guess I didn't go to that deeper still thing until <laughs> was I in my 60s. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so you're talking about you carried that a long decades <laughs> and that, that eats at you, especially when you're wrestling with the whole, you know, I'm not good enough thing. That's just that shame and guilt is stabbing. And then what a horrible thing to tell somebody of don't ever say this to anybody because I have the opposite thing. It's a matter of, no, there's somebody else out there that needs to hear that you can overcome that moment and heal from it, right? So, you know, yeah, I, I agree. I remember you coming back from that. That was a, I would agree, that was a powerful moment. And that's, that's I see that as beautiful. So, um. If you had, and this is, this is kind of weird, this is difficult, it may be, I don't know. If you had to pick like a couple words or like, let's say a sentence or a really short paragraph just to, in a nutshell, describe your life. Okay, and I, I know that's weird, but I've had everybody do this. Uh, what, what would that be? Like if you had to give the cliff notes of your life, what would it be? I guess before God, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't have joy. I guess I was always worried what people thought about me. Did they like me? So I, I didn't talk a lot. <laughs> I don't know. I just before it was not a good life. I mean, you have happy moments and things, but you're not living your full life like God wants you to live. Sure. And then afterwards, it's there's so much joy and rest. I don't know. No, oh, that's good. Yeah. What do you mean, joy and rest? That's fantastic. <laughs> what about you, Scott? Yeah, honestly, for me... It, even Ziblar, I think it's that I saw victory from surrender. It's, I had to give up before I could go forward. And I was used to always fighting forward. And here I had to stop and just completely surrender. And and the difference is incredible. So this is going to be kind of a, an odd question because, but I, I think it's important when we look at our story and you know, you guys have heard me say it, like, I don't think, you know, our stories matter and they're good stories, but 
when our stories really take on purpose is when they collide with God, right? And we oh, yeah. see the difference in who and what we are. Um, you know, you described your moment of dropping to your seat and unloading all that and God being there with you and your moment of realizing you needed Jesus in Morristown, right? If you now, the post-Jesus Scott and the post-Jesus Suzanne, like, it's easy to look at ourselves back then and say, okay, I was chasing girls or, I, you know, I didn't like who I was or didn't feel good enough. If you could talk to the old Scott or talk to the old Suzanne and just say, this is who you really are. If you find God, you're going to find this. What would you say? And I know that's kind of an odd question, but like, how would you describe, if you could talk to the old you, how would you describe who you are now to them? Does that make sense? Yeah. You want to go first? Well, that I'm loved. I'm a daughter of the king. I am special. And, and that's all that matters, what God thinks. Absolutely. Good. Yeah. You're way better at this than I am. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm crying. That's okay. <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't know. That it is a tough question. Um, I think if I had a chance to go back and tell old Scott what this was about, I'd want to slap him upside the head a little <laughs> bit and say, "Look." It, you, you can have a better purpose than this. You can do better than this. You are better than this. Uh, because I, I, I'll, I'll be quite honest. Until, until I did surrender, I never would have thought I'd be in a jail preaching to guys in shackles and chains. I never thought that I could have put my marriage back together with Suzanne. I couldn't have done anything. It, it wasn't, I was thinking I could fix everything. I couldn't have done that. Uh, I would tell that young Scott, you need to learn early to surrender, to let go, and let God start doing some work in you and see where you go because it's going to be an adventure. And it has been. It still is. That's awesome. Yeah. So, you know, as you look at things now, you know, even say, in, like a minute in your 60s, right, or whatever the case may be, you know, it's one of these things where when you look at life and you guys having over the last, I mean, you look at just since I've known you guys, you guys look at the change in y'all's lives in the last how many ever years. It's been dramatic, right? I mean, which is fantastic. But now you're in a different place. Yeah, you look back and wish you would have done some things differently. You wish you would have, you know, had different priorities, maybe at home or not made certain mistakes, blah, blah, blah. But knowing where you are now and you look towards the future, you know, obviously, sometimes this isn't just a super easy answer, but are, what are some things now that you've seen so much that God has done in your life? What are some things now looking forward? You'd say, I'd like God to do this in my life, or here's some maybe some dreams or some plans that I, I want to see happen, or that can go a lot of different directions. But what are some things you'd like to see God do in your life in the future? For me, I, the easy answer is just more, uh, more because uh, I think before in life I was probably, you know, a little bit afraid of what was coming up. I'm not afraid anymore. Um, the, as you and most everybody else knows, we've had a lot of bumps along the way. We're still having them. We're still having those bumps and those little things that go on. But I'm no longer afraid of those bumps. Because I, I understand that as long as there are those bumps there, he's still working behind us, and he's still pushing us forward. I, I'm right now. My biggest thing is I just want to be more in the Word every single day, so that I never have a a, a time pop up where somebody asks me a question that I don't have a, a good answer that points them back to Christ. I don't want to. I don't want to be there. And. COVID-19 has helped a lot with that. So <laughs> my Bible is well worn out right now, which is good. The one thing I wanted to say was that, 
You know, when I first started coming here to campus, I think I kind of shrank in the corner. <laughs> and the change I've seen is that I go around and talk to people, new people, where he only has to talk 15 minutes to the jail, <laughs> to in the jail. I have to do like a sermon for 45 minutes, which I would have never thought was possible for me. Um, I hope that gets started back again. Um, I've started going with Love Riot and love doing that. Um, just hope God keeps my body going. I can do stuff like that. Um, Unpack that, the uh, jail stuff real quick. Just like what are, you know, what's your favorite part of that or what are some things that you'd like to see God do in that? Just because that's a huge part that God kind of just, I mean, the story there, right? We know they just yeah. opened so many doors there, right? So, uh, you know, within, like, what are some things that you guys maybe have a heart for in that or would like to see God do in that or you know, because like I agree, knowing you when you first started coming, there's no way you would have ever walked into a jail and preached, right? Or even taught or whatever you want to call what you do. But, you know, but you do, right? So that change, you see something, you see a purpose, you see fruit, you see something. Knowing that now, like what are some things you want to see God to do, do in that? Or what's some things that makes that part of your story now? Like what do you love about that? Does it, you know what I'm saying? I love seeing when it's not so much a, I used to just do a, you know, a sermon like that, but now I've started doing more where it's interactive so that I can get them involved and they tell me a little bit more about themselves and, um, and more scriptures for them, you know, like printing off scriptures for them to keep. And um, I don't know, I think what I'd like to see is some more where they get out of jail. How can we help them get back into society? How can you stop it from them going back in? And, you know, what keeps them from you know, doing the same old thing over and over again, you know. Because if they go back to their family, is you know, are they doing drugs or, I don't know, their yeah. friends or whatever. No, that's good. I, mean, I totally agree with her because we've, um, uh, and I've been in contact with uh, Phil Holmes and, and Norman Holland, and we've formed a little committee, and we're trying to put together a mentorship program for men and women that, that get out, that we can mentor them up with somebody in a church nearby that's comfortable for them to not to hand feed them and not to give them something, but to walk beside them and, uh, and help them get back. Because just like what Suzanne said, the biggest thing you see when you get in there is you, you, you see the hearts of people. And, and even so, though some of these people's crimes are pretty bad, sometimes you see the heart behind that and you realize they really want to get out and do good. Like she said, again, they fall back into that same old trap again. Uh, and that for me, that's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see them get out and have an opportunity to do something, to find a, find a job, you know, to find a church, to have somebody to walk beside them, not to hold their hand and do everything for them, but someone to walk beside them and to be their mentor as they go through all this, because it's going to be a hard thing. It's going to be tough. This world is tough on people. If you've been in jail or in prison, it's going to be twice as tough. It's going to be very hard. Um, I will say this, that uh, I'm so enthusiastic. Uh, as I had posted about the jail had requested some study Bibles for the cell blocks. They requested them because the inmates, both male and female, were having Bible studies inside the cell block. We haven't been in there in 14 months. So it wasn't us that was doing this. This is totally a God thing to know that they're asking for that. They're keeping that alive in there. Um, that part is beautiful to see, and you just want that to continue to happen in there. Because in the end, it shouldn't matter whether or not it's us that goes in. It should matter whether or not they're having an interaction with God in there. So, That's awesome. Mm -hmm. 
Anything that we haven't kind of talked about that maybe you thought, oh man, I didn't say that, or whatever the case may be that you want to throw in? And just so you know, you guys have done a great job, right? Yeah. Okay. I didn't, I didn't cry. I'll no, quit rubbing in. No. We do. I've seen you cry, but yes. it's rare. I have, I have cried in this church more than I ever cried in my whole life. Good. I okay. hope that continues. <laughs> All right. Well, then this will be the only scripted part is I've had everybody, you guys know at the end, say, uh, my name is, you know, you know, I'm this and this is my story. What I'll have you guys do is just say, I'm Scott Boner, I'm Susan, Suzanne Boner, and this is my story, right? So you'll do say, this is my story at the same time. Okay. That makes sense? Okay. So yeah, it's going to be a little, we may have to do this two or three times. That's, that's good, or 10. So I'll just kind of point to you, and then I'll point to you, and then when I point again, it'll be, and this is my story together, okay? All right, here we go. My name is Scott Boatner. My name is Suzanne Boatner. And this, and this is, is our story. story. Oh, I said mine. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. <laughs>